Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. One theme that I hear more and more is the importance and the difficulty of telling good stories whether it's in presentations at work, whether it is in job interviews, or maybe you want more media exposure on TV, news, radio, heck, being on podcasts. Uh, Maybe you have to pitch to investors or prospects, or you're going to be presenting at more conferences. The question I keep hearing is, what makes for a good story and how do you tell it? And rather than just work on answering that myself, I thought I would take things in a slightly different direction today for our show and bring in the big guns. So, there's a celebrity sighting on Speaking to Influence today, and my guest is none other than Luann Kahn. Luann is an eight-time Emmy Award-winning journalist for NBC10. She is the author of a wonderful, funny, and inspiring book called I Dare Me, How I Rebooted and Recharged My Life by Doing Something New Every Day. And she's also currently the Director of Career Services at the Klein College of Media at Temple University. And with that, let me turn the tables and... Ooh, this is a little bit of pressure on me. Be the interviewer of interviewers. Luann, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you and your audience. So, okay, the pressure's on. I got to make sure this is a really good show. I have to run the conversation and, and, and get do my job in helping you to tell us the kinds of stories that we are going to find most valuable. And I want to make it clear to everybody that this is really, you know, Luann's a journalist, so her work is pulling the stories out of people and identifying the stories. And so we'll be looking at a lot of what her work has identified uh, with regard to the core of a story. And we'll also look at then how that applies to maybe a more average business role, corporate job, et cetera. So um, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Now, before we get into the actual uh, interview questions of sorts, Luann, tell me, as far as stories are concerned, What was your favorite story as a child, or at least one of them? I was a huge Nancy Drew fan. Okay. Nancy Drew mystery books. I, I, you know, I was thinking back, like, what was my earliest books? It was probably Dr. Seuss. And back when I was growing (laughs) up, Dr. Seuss was brand new, you know, red fish, blue fish, one fish, two fish. I mean, I think those were my first books and I loved the imagination of that. Uh, But, um, and maybe the Nancy Drew books explains why I eventually became an investigative reporter. Boy, sure. I, I loved a mystery, and I loved that the 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 main character was a, a girl, a woman, you know, yes. which wasn't that common back then. Right, right. So, and I remember reading them as well. I think those are, along with the Dr. Seuss, are classics that just seem to transcend generations, which is a lot of fun. And my my son is four, and he is very much a Dr. Seuss fan. So we'll see if I can eventually get him no, into Nancy Drew. It's a classic, right? That's yes. how you know it's good. It keeps going. Green Eggs and Ham. That's that's the one that's Green always and there. Ham. <laughs> ham I am. Now, do you remember how we first met? And it was, what, like six or seven years ago, something like that now? We met at an event where we were both speaking. Yes. I think I was your warm-up act, which was really intimidating. (laughs) Oh, you were my warm-up. You know, that's funny. I don't remember that, but I remember hearing you speak, and I was like, wow. I was really (laughs) impressed, and I wanted to meet you. Well, the the funny thing was that we got set. You know, this was it was this... uh, event honoring Lily Ledbetter, as you mentioned, who was the champion originally of Equal Work for Equal Pay. And, you know, I was relatively new to this kind of business world. And so we're, we're at the, in the banquet room, and someone sits me down at this table. And, you know, I was not, and still, frankly, I'm not much of a television watcher. So I have to admit, I had never seen you on TV. I didn't know who you were. And they <laughs> sit me down fun. next to you and I, you know, I introduced myself, you introduced yourself. Hi, I'm Luann Kahn. And I thought, oh, that's nice. So let me learn about this Luann person. And then of course I get up, I do my, my introductory remarks on the stage and then they introduce you and they give your bio. And I went, oh my gosh, I am an idiot. I'm sitting here talking to this woman like, do, do, do. I have no idea who she is. And she's like, okay, so I have eight Emmy awards sitting on my desk and, uh, you know, 40 years of journalistic integrity, but sure. Let's just chat like this is a completely, you were so generous and so 
unassuming and personable. I just loved sitting next to you. And you didn't make me feel like an idiot, even though I <laughs> completely you were, felt like no one way. on my own. <laughs> no way. You were so impressive. I thought, wow, the, you know, you're, the tips that you were talking about how to speak. I think you were even talking about that day about how to properly say your name. And, wow, you know, <laughs> I, claim I could learn some things from this woman. And I have. You know, frankly, over the seven years, you know, sometimes I've done many things through my profession that I, I learn and, you know, by doing, but you are someone who can really break it down and go, but this is why this works. And that's why you're very good at what you do. I do it without sometimes thinking about, but why does that, why, you know, why is, 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 is this formula what works? And um, so I was very impressed with the way that you can teach others. Oh, thank you. I, that is truly high praise, high compliment. And uh, you know, we've worked together on a number of projects for clients over the years since then. Uh, and I think it's just been so much fun to be able because you have the art, you have that just instinct that knows how to make things happen. So when we put your art and my science together, I think it's uh, some there fun you magic. Go. Yeah, it, it's very good. It's a good mix. So let's get into the concept of stories. Why do stories matter? Why can't you just explain things to people? Well, maybe I could tell you a story too. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Help explain. Perfect. So for example, I, you know, I wrote a book called I Dare Me and I do speaking engagements where I am trying to convince people to do the new. For a year, I did something new every single day and I am convinced this is the way we keep our life unstuck. So I can just tell you that and I can say, so you know what, you should do something new every day. But that is not going to convince you. Right. What's going to convince you and what, what studies show is true is it's a story that will convince you. Why? Something that hits your head and your heart because it becomes memorable. Mm. You're more likely you will attach that story to the message. If I just tell you the message, okay, go out and do the new, you'll go, okay, what? But then if I tell you a story like this, one of the people who read my book, her name is uh, Cindy and she lives in Missouri. She said her life was stuck. Her career as a real estate agent was stuck. Everything was bad. And she decided she would start doing something new every day. But her journey was doing give back karmic, give backs to her community. So she volunteered at a shelter and she put random positive notes on cars and she started a book club. And the crazy thing is three months later, her business picked up. Her life was better. She was happier. And she said, you know what? I don't think it's coincidence. I believe I'm relating to the world in a different way and the world is relating to me differently. Mm. And studies show that's true. Now, that's the story. That was pretty quick. Now, if I was in front of a live audience, I would probably expand and elaborate that story maybe a little bit more. But you may remember that point far more because you're going to remember, well, someone named Cindy out in Missouri, she did this and it worked for her. You're going to remember that. It hits your head. It hits your heart. I've got, you know, a dozen other stories like that to, because I know that's far more effective than me just saying, you know, if you face your fear, you'll gain courage. Okay, well, give me an example of that. Right, right. The example to prove it to me. Prove um, it. Make, give that some credibility. Yes. Tell yes. me the story behind that. You know, um, it's just so much more powerful. I think the, uh, I believe it was Maya Angelou who said, you know, people will often forget what you say and they may forget what you make them think, but they will always remember how you make them feel. And that's the other thing. And that's so true. You know, um, in the speaker world, a lot of us say, you know, it doesn't matter what you say, it's how you say it. I don't think that's completely true. That is completely not true, but right, that is certainly it's not true. Right. However, there is something to that in that if you're passionate about what you're saying, as I am passionate about what I believe, um, and it will, you will feel that. Yes. You will feel that the way I'm explaining it. You will know that the words I'm saying are, are, are um, authentic yes. and sincere. Yes. And, um, but if I just 
talk like this and I just act like, oh, I just, you know, hey, this doesn't mean that much to me. And, you know, I just, uh, time to go. When is this over? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh, right. That uh, that isn't going to work. Well, the the analogy that I like to use and to let's let's clarify that uh, what you say versus how you say it piece. The problem with the statement of it's not what you say, it's how you say it, is that it says it makes it sound like one matters and the other doesn't. The fact is what matters is that those two halves have to work together. It's when they don't gel, when the verbal, which is the what you say, does not match the verb, the vocal and the visual, which is the how you say it part, that that's when the audience doesn't feel like something makes sense. So if your content is good, the what you say, but you don't deliver it well, it's like dipping a pearl in mud. There's no, something no, no. good in there, but you can't find it. And the opposite yes. is also true where if you have sort of pointless content or no true message or no value in what you're saying, but you deliver it really charismatically, okay, it might be entertaining, but it's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. You can do it and it's interesting, but like, what's the point? There's no real value hey, everybody, in Everybody, this. this is why she's the doctor, the PhD. <laughs> Because, because, she puts, because she said she puts because, lipstick on a pig. Wait, what did I? No, miss? no, 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 <laughs> no. It's because this is correct. This is right. I, I mean, yes. If I, if I'm just very energetic about some idea and it doesn't make any sense, you'll go, "Oh, that was fun." What did she say? What was that about? <laughs> right. right. But yes, you have to have both. You have to have the right message, and you have to have the right delivery. So, with that, if you've got the right message and the right delivery. Or, or how to create that, how to set it upright. Um, what makes for a good story that, that has that potential? You have taught, um, I, there's a way that you set it up for a lot of, of the people that we've worked with that I love. What's, what's that rule of thumb for reporters? What are they looking for? Well, in the news world, we talk about this a lot. What's new now, next, wow. Say that again. New, now, next, wow. Okay, so break that in the down newsroom, for us. Yeah, in a newsroom, every single morning, there is a meeting to decide what stories are going to be covered. And it's often basically determined by that. What is new? Okay, what's, what's happening that's different today? What's now? Okay, this is happening right now. We got to get there and cover it. It's present. It's ongoing. Go live, right? Um, what is next? What is coming up that everyone needs to know about? We need to preview. We need to know about. And what's wow? Okay, like, oh my gosh, can you believe that? Uh, we always call it the Hey Martha story. You're watching TV and you see something and go, oh my gosh, Hey Martha, what? <laughs> you gotta look at this, right? Um, that's the way we decide what stories are going to get coverage. So, um, but I think it's helpful for everybody when you're deciding what you're going to talk about, what's new about this? What, what's now? What's wow? Or what's the next thing that, that we need to know? Um, and that's that, that information. But it's, it's got to feel like it's relevant. Yes. It's got to feel like it's relevant to right now. And that goes for anybody out there. So whether you're doing an investor pitch, whether you are uh, talking to your clients about diversifying your portfolio and doing more impact investing rather than just you know, generic blue chip stocks or whether you are looking at whatever it is, you need people to understand why this is important, why this is relevant and framing it in terms of uh, not a tabloid-esque reality TV mellow drama new now next wow, but it's the relevance. It's why should you care? Why is this interesting? Why is this novel? Why is this uh, valuable? Why should it matter to you? I think if you can frame it in one or more ideally of that new now next wow uh, angles, then people are more interested as a, and of course you need to back it up with the numbers. You need to back it up with the why, whether you do insurance sales or you do something else, it's, it's, why does this matter to you? And that's, will capture the interest, I think, which is part of the importance. Can you capture their interest first and then maintain it? And with these framings that should be able to help you do that. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. And, and you do this yourself, you know, you talk about what do the candidates look like? You know, what are they, what are they saying with their expressions and their voice and, and what are the mistakes they're making and what are they doing? Well, right. That is relevant to right now. That's yeah. relevant to 
And so that knowledge and expertise you have is, you know, maybe if it wasn't an election year, we go, well, that's not so wow at the moment, but it sure is wow now. Sure. And it sure is now now. That's yes, and it's now now. Yeah. <laughs> Quite literally now, this now that we're in the whole election <laughs> season right now. Um, so let's talk about some do's and don'ts when crafting your story, when delivering your story, I think sometimes the what not to do's are easier than what to do's. If I were just to say like, what makes a good story? There's so many things to begin with. Let's start by narrowing down and, and crossing off the what not to do's. What, what makes for a bad story or a bad interview? Well, what makes a bad interview is someone who is flat. I call it flat. Flat okay. in their voice, flat in their expression, um, I mean, their facial expressions. Their okay. facial expression, yes. Flat in their um, presence. You know, the best interviews, and I've interviewed so many amazing people in my life, and some of them surprise you how great they are, or how terrible they are. Ooh, uh, okay, let's go there. So let's uh, give me an example. Who would surprise you with how terrible they are? Okay, not to go tabloid on this, but I'm really dying to know who's um, terrible as all right, an interview. So somebody who just comes to mind, and you may or may not know her, depending on your your. Uh, pop culture knowledge, but Selena Gomez came into our studio one day, and I know a lot of people in the TV station were really excited. She was very hot at the time. So who is she so for those she's who an don't actress, know? She's um, I, I think she sings as well. I, I have to say I wasn't, it, everyone was more excited than I was, <laughs> okay. but she wasn't excited about doing this at all. She was, um, she was coming into our entertainment show, a live entertainment show we were doing at NBC 10, and she clearly was on tour and she clearly was exhausted and she clearly didn't want to be there. Mm. And, you know, so I asked her a question and she gave me a, like a three word answer. Um, and she just, everything about her presence was, I'm not here. So mm. that's that. Um, I've interviewed Donald Trump. I have interviewed uh, Bill Clinton. And those are two of the most magnetic in person people to interview you could possibly imagine i mean there's a reason they pop through the screen but i will tell you in person uh, i think what makes both amazingly both of them very effective is they look you in the eye they make you feel like you are the only one they are talking to mm. and they are really excited about whatever it is as opposed and i have to say um you know i like hillary clinton but she's not a great interview <laughs> You okay, know? why not? She's not. She's she can be very flat mm. and very technical. Mm. You know, um, she'll get down in the minutia of something, and you know she's brilliant, but you know, too many details as opposed to her husband, who will tell you a story, right? Yeah. Who will make you feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, I shouldn't have gone there. But uh, <laughs> but as as opposed to Hillary has a completely different different way of communicating. Although it's interesting, I just saw an interview with her and I feel like she's gotten better. She's gotten mm. warmer. Um, the pressure's um, off now. The pressure's off, right? You always felt like, oh, she's holding, holding back. You don't want someone to feel that. You, the other thing I would say is what makes a good interview and something for you to talk, think about when you're being interviewed by someone is forget about the mic, forget about the camera, I mean, unless you're doing it virtually, but if you're, even if you're doing it virtually, you're having a conversation with someone. Remember, you're having that conversation with someone um, and think about that. I think that's another way not to be so nervous. Just, just know that if it's a good conversation you're having with the interviewer, then you're probably doing a great job communicating to people who are listening. Yes. Yes, the, the listener wants to feel like they're eavesdropping on a, on a conversation with somebody else. And if you're having a great conversation with whoever the, the one person is, then they get drawn in as well. It's like you're all sitting on at the bar together just having drinks. These two are chatting and you're just there but absorbed. Yes. So, but that means it's got to feel like a good conversation. So if you're being interviewed, your answers can't be too short and terse and like you're protecting something. On the other hand, they can't be too long and go on forever. Because then, yes. you know, most of these interviews are 
oh, three minutes at most, that's a lot of time on TV, maybe five minutes. You know, that's another good thing. Find out how much time you have. If you're going to tell a two minute story, your whole time could be up. Well, and boy, have I learned that lesson the hard way in the, the last few months, you know, with the elections, I've been on a couple of different channels with doing uh, the, the reviews of the debates. But again, I'm apolitical, just like your storytelling. It's not about who, wh- who you prefer politically, Trump, mm-hmm. Clinton, either Clinton or otherwise. And so when I'm on, yes, I've got usually three to four minutes for my for my segment, but that also includes they're going to queue up some some video clips. They're going to ask questions. They're going to make their comments. So my answers are supposed to be like 20, 30, maybe 40 seconds at a right. piece. And that's about it. Otherwise, it, it and that's been hard, holy moly, to get answers down that tight, especially if you don't know what the questions are going to be in advance. You may think you have a sense, but it may or may not happen. No, yeah. And I think it's good to prepare as much as you can and start maybe even putting a clock on it as you answer. So you get a sense of what does 20 seconds sound like? Yep. What is 40 seconds? What's yes. a minute? Because- oh, it evaporates. It evaporates. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it does. But I too have made that mistake. Um, I'm, I'm used to being the person interviewing, but when I went on tour for my book, I remember being in a studio in Atlanta and a lovely, I was invited into the studio to talk about a book and I had an appearance there in town. I was doing a book signing and the interviewer, I think, asked me one question. Well, tell me, how did you start on this journey of doing something new every day? Well, (laughs) I told her well, first I had this idea and then I did this and then I went, I, I made a list and then I found out this. I, I went on and on and on. And, and then she said, well, thank you very much, Lynn. It's been nice having you. See you later. You know, I had eaten up all, almost all the time and given her no ability to follow up with questions. And that makes a bad interview, mm. right? I had just hogged the whole thing like I was in charge. <laughs> talked and talked and talked. And then she was like, okay, well, great. Thanks, Luann. Bye. (laughs) You know, we're out of time. So, you know, you just have to be aware of those things. So what should you have done if you could go back and have a do-over? Oh, I should have had a 20 second answer to, you know, I was stuck. It should have been something like, you know, I was stuck in my life I didn't want to change. There had been a downsizing and and technology I didn't like. My daughter had this idea to do the new and I started this journey and it changed everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it might just be that. And then let her say, well, how? What happened? Yes. You know, let the interviewer pull some things out. You know, you don't have to tell everything in that first answer. It is also the mistake people make oftentimes in that first interview question. If you're being interviewed for a job. Yes. Oh, tell me about yourself. I hate that question. That's what I, I do a lot of interview coaching for, for this purpose. And so many of them say, well, how do I answer that question? If the first question is tell me about yourself and it doesn't matter whether it's an, uh, whether it's an entry level position. I know you're coaching students who are graduating with their bachelor's degrees or maybe a master's degree. So they're new, relatively new Mm -hmm. and young, Um, or whether I'm coaching people for executive roles, they're looking for C-level officer positions. They still get that first question. Tell me about yourself. What do you do with that? Yeah. Well, you know, and I think this is, this is how I coach students, but I also think it applies to all of us, you know, start where you are now then where you've been, and then where you're going. And you tie it up with a pretty bow, but it cannot be really more than a minute. If you've ever answered that question and you realize, oh my God, I'm talking and talking and talking, go down the rabbit hole, and then you're out of breath, and you're like, what just happened? (laughs) You don't want to do that. You That's a question you can always prep for, and you should practice. Not to the point where it's completely memorized, because it should probably come out It will come out differently different times, but you can prepare for that. And I I think you should. I tell my students, do not wing that question. No. You really should try not to wing any of those questions. A year or two ago, when I was doing a lot more of the local uh, TV 
business shows and those kinds of things. And I got that question a lot from different people and I did not have a clean answer. I want to go back to all those shows, apologize <laughs> to the hosts and say, I'm so sorry. I ate up like 12 minutes rambling on because people would say, well, how did you start this business? And, and, or how did you get involved in X? And because there's not really an easy, I went from A to B to C, the normal trajectory, you know, entry level and then manager and then executive. It didn't work that way. It was this long and windy path. And I thought, well, if I don't tell them X and Y, that they won't understand the connections between these things. And you know what, Laura, nobody cares. That's not the point. There was a connection in here. Just figure out three little stops along the way. Exactly. What's one thing that they, that you learned from each of those points that somehow gelled into this current existence that you have. And if they want more information on the rest, take them back, but they do not need to know all the detail. There is a difference between relevant detail and essential detail. And each audience is going to have a very different definition of what essential detail is. And I think that goes right back to um, that example that you gave earlier with regard to Hillary Clinton and why she was less of a, of a engaging interview than the others because she got too technically lost in the weeds. As I hear that a lot. And, uh, you know, one of the in my regular interviews here on the podcast, typically when I'm interviewing executives, one of the questions that I always ask them is, uh, you know, what do you wish when your when your employees, your direct reports, are presenting information to you? What do you wish many of them would do differently? And that answer is so um, frequently cited: the idea of people get lost in the weeds. They give me too many details. Just get to the point. Like read my mind, figure out what I need to know about this. If I want to know the details, I'll ask you for them. But do not open mouth, turn on fire hose, and drown me in these details. I cannot drink from a fire hose. Uh, just figure. You do the work. Digest it for me, and then we'll go from there. And yeah, that's so give, hard for people to do. Give the cliff notes, but they have to be interesting cliff notes. Yes. Right. So in other words, if you said, uh, wow, and a lot of people ask, oh, how did you come to write a book? Well, there were a million steps. So this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then someone talked to this person, and then I got an agent. But in the end, I say, hey, you know what? I, I did a blog for a year, and a major publisher asked me to write a book. <laughs> That's the story. I mean, there was actually a lot more things that went on. But in the end, that's really what happened. Right, right. At least that's the, the big 10,000 foot view trajectory. And that's yep. all people need to know in the story right up front. Again, if they want more details, they'll ask you for it. Now, people often ask, how do you prepare for an interview? How can you overcome the nerves, the, the jitters for whether you're on camera or not? But can you give some tips? How can you be a more confident storyteller? I mean, there's nothing like preparation for one. I think the more you're familiar with what you're going to say and the more comfortable you are. Um, I would also say learn as much as you can about the interviewer. If you can get into the environment you're going to be in as soon as you can earlier than the interview. Um, the other thing that always makes me feel better and it's, I wouldn't say it's a trick. I would just say that, especially if I'm speaking in front of a major audience or someone is going to interview me, I like to have a conversation with them right beforehand. You know, it's, it's casual, it's chit chat. If I'm walking into a huge audience, I want to I want to meet some of the people in the room and I all this works for me. I always find that makes me more comfortable. It helps me understand who's my audience. Oh, it's, it's Joe in the front row. Oh, Joe, we just had a great conversation. It always puts me at ease and reminds me, you know, everyone's friendly and, and ready to hear the information you have. Um, but I do believe in preparation and, um, I feel like the more you're prepared, the less nervous you are. But the other thing is it's just experience. You just have to put yourself out there. Yeah. And, and you get better with experience. And most people are afraid of public speaking. Most people are worried about being interviewed. But I do think the other trick, again, is focus on the person you're talking to. Yeah. Don't think about anything else. You're communicating with one person right there. And if that goes well, the rest of it's going well. 
And that's applicable also just going back to the idea of presentations and speaking to virtually or in person in your job, uh, giving a, a presentation to your boss or in, during your department meetings or whatever it happens to be. Thinking about, you know, I always say that the for, public speaking, first of all, let's, we're going to redefine that for a moment because as far as my, as far as I'm concerned, the definition of public speaking is anytime you're talking to somebody besides yourself. Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't okay. matter if it's one on one, it doesn't matter yep. if it's on the phone. You have an audience, you have someone who has, who you want to hear your message. And how do you relate it to them in a way that they can hear it? So whether it's one-on-one -on -one or one to a thousand, you are public speaking. So you're practicing it every day, or you should be thinking about how you're practicing that every day. And when you realize that you need to just think about who are they, what matters to them, my four-word secret to confident public speaking, and it's in my book, In Speaking to Influence, is it's not about you. So true. Why? Right, because you are, in the speaker world, we say it's a present, as in a presentation. You are giving a gift to the audience. It's not about you. You think it's about you because you're the one on the stage or you're the one being um, interviewed. But if you aren't connecting to your audience, then, um, and it's all about you, then you're not really giving you're not really doing your job. Yeah. So it's got to be a present. I, and I, I think it's, a, it's in your head. And I think the more you think about, am I giving something to the audience that they need? The better you're going to be. So, you know, in fact, for uh, professional speakers, we often, we often will interview people who are going to be in the audience mm -hmm. so that we know something about them. We call, you know, what are the pain points? Sure. What are the things that you're worried about? What are the things that you would like to get out of this presentation? So I know I'm going to be on target here in my presentation. Yes. I learn a lot from that. Sure. So figuring out what does the audience need and want to get from this and then figure out how to give it to them. That should be your focus. And if you are the expert, if you know this information that they need or want, all you have to do is give it to them, right? How hard is that? Well, <laughs> it sounds simple, right? Um, but of course, there's an art to it and, and, and getting in tune with your audience. But I, I do think it all works together. The more in tune you are with the audience, you know, the more you understand what they need, the more relevant your message is. Um, I think that all will make you feel more confident and comfortable. Right. You know, you know when it's off. <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing worse than being in front of an audience and going, boy, this is not working. This is not resonating. But boy, you know when it's on. And there is an amazing feeling when you are just connecting with that person or that that room, whatever it is. And that's that's what we want to help everybody today figure out how to do, how to have that magical electric connection with whoever they're talking to that day. Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to wrap this up a little bit now with something that I do have all of my guests share with the audience, and that is the Listener 24-Hour Influence Challenge. This is where I give my guests, so Luann, I'm going to offer the opportunity to you, the, an invitation to talk directly to the audience, directly to the listeners, and challenge them to take one step in that they have to complete in the next 24 hours to help them have more influence. What do you want to challenge the, the audience to do today? So this is a dare, right? Yes. The book is I Dare Me. So go for it. Dare okay. the audience. So here, here is, I like this challenge a lot. So here's the dare. Go on live, on Facebook Live, somewhere on social media, whatever your social media is, Facebook Live. Um, I think you can go live on Instagram. There is a way some of you may have the ability to go live on LinkedIn. That's kind of new. Um, but go live. Just do it. Um, well, all right. I, I, I put a caveat with that. Okay. Plan. What would you like to tell your audience? Obviously, your Facebook audience is different than your LinkedIn audience. If you're, right. you're addressing your LinkedIn audience, talk about something in your professional life, something you've observed, maybe something during the pandemic. Um, you know, I just wrote a blog about um, how to create a virtual office 
uh, in lieu of us not meeting in the office space. Maybe if I was doing it, I might talk about that live. Think of one thing, maybe one tip you'd like to share with your audience. If it's Facebook Live, it's your friends, right? Talk to them about something. Say, hey, I just want to connect with you and tell you about what's going on, but plan it, okay? Hit that live button and go. You might be surprised at, um, you know, it might feel, uh, it, it, it will definitely, it could be facing a fear if you haven't done this before. But I think if you do this, you'll go, oh my gosh, that was kind of fun. And maybe you'll do more of that. And it doesn't have to be a half an hour show, right? It oh, can be two like minutes. Yeah. It could be, I've done Facebook Live for a minute. Just to say hi. Hi, everybody. I was going uh, live on Facebook during the pandemic for a while, every, every day, just going, okay, here we are. Well, here's my tip of the day. <laughs> Right. Sure. I had no idea how long we'd be here. So Sure. So people could actually, if they're really, really nervous about this concept, they could go on Facebook and literally just go live for a minute just to see if anybody shows up. And if so, hang up, <laughs> say hello, and then log off. But give it 60 seconds just to yeah. say I went live, just to try yeah. it out. You can always delete the archived video afterwards, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right. So 60 seconds just to say you did it and get off. And then, oops, take it to the next step from there. We dare you. I love it. Okay, you have officially been dared by Luann Khan. Pick up the gauntlets from there. That was fun. Luann, tell us where people can get more information about your book and about just you. Well, if you're interested in learning more about I Dare Me, the book, uh, or getting my blog, uh, a weekly blog, go to Luann Khan. Dot com. It's L-U-A-N-N-C-A-H-N.com. I'd be happy to put you on my mailing list. You can find I Dare Me still in bookstores. <laughs> yeah. If you go to bookstores, you could still find it uh, at your Barnes & Noble. You can get it on Amazon. There's an audio book. I'd love for you to read the book. And you know what? I answer all of my email. So if you want to email me at Luann at luanncon.com. I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, but again, you can find all of that information at my website, luanncon.com. That is fantastic. And I have read I Dare Me, and it is so much fun and so inspiring. So I really do encourage all of you to, to pick it up at your convenience. And look, we've got plenty of time because we're not going out. So add it to your reading or to your listening list today. Luann, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It was so much fun. Thank you. And to everybody else out there, thank you for tuning in once again. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. And of course, if you haven't had a chance to do so yet, uh, be sure to give us a five-star review on iTunes so we can help more people access the opportunity to expand their confidence, presence, and influence. With that, I'm Dr. Laura Sokola with Vocal Impact Productions. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.